Coming to you from Grand Rounds Brewing Company and Restaurant, Our Town. A prototyping festival was held last fall and 16 entrants displayed their designs down on the Peace Plaza. Eric Anderson was one of four designers whose work has been chosen for possible permanent installation. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Well, you and I go way back. We were part of the prototyping festival together. Mm -hmm. What prompted you to be part of the prototyping festival last fall? Well, really it was when they started having idea jams within the community, getting people together, bouncing ideas around. Um, up until then, all I had done, uh, had done, I guess, in the field of art and, and writing was go up to my office, put my head down for eight hours, and I was <laughs> in my own head. And I didn't um, before consider what it would be like to try to take a concept into something very real in the world um, that would affect people's lives. And, but to do it um, utilizing and working off of and learning from other people's skill sets and passions. And, um, seeing that begin to grow at these events, I said, like, I want to try this just to see what it's like. Um, it'll probably fall apart, who knows. But um, it was an um, incredible experience to, to kind of throw the idea out there and then say, oh, now we have to make it. And, like, yeah, how definitely. How does that happen? <laughs> And you had a really unique design. Can you tell us a little bit about the origin story behind this design that you proposed and then um, put in the prototyping festival? Mm -hmm. um, so when I uh, lived just north of Boston studying for my undergrad, uh, I took an overnight position at a local hospital as a security officer, thinking I would get away with some homework. It was a very quiet town. Um, but So I didn't know at the time that when Mass General and other Boston area hospitals would fill up um, and their beds would fill, they would start to um, transplant uh, patients out into the suburbs. Um, so the evenings we filled with um, code whites, um, patient restraints, and one-to-one -one, um, suicide watches. So for example, my very first um, patient restraint, it was probably around 3 in the morning, and the um, ER doctor called for all hands, which is grab an arm or leg because the patient was at risk of harming themselves or someone else. So after they were um, successfully restrained safely, um, it, everyone was out of breath my shirt was soaked through with my sweat and the patient's sweat. Mm -hmm. And it was just uncomfortably quiet. Then the intercom system that initially called the code white to the hospital began to play a lullaby, which meant that uh, on the sixth floor maternity ward, a baby was just born, which just increased the context of it for me, for myself, in that um, it made it more complicated and much more um, uh, difficult to, um, to associate one feeling to what had just happened, knowing that there was this individual um, that we had to restrain and then the, the childbirth. And thinking about this and health and the built environment for the prototyping festival, like how can we, how can I create that feeling for others in a non-invasive way? Mm -hmm. Great. And so can you tell us a little bit about how the design works? How does it mm -hmm. So it's an art installation that uses color and light to translate individual health events okay. um, and kind of broadcast them out into the community so they can be shared experiences, connecting visitors, residents, um, patients, all within the same area under these, um, to these events that are happening to real people and um, that we are all have connections to in some way in our lives, I guess. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think a lot of the prototypes had a lot of connecting, mm -hmm. how to connect with community, engage community, make everyone feel like we're one part of mm -hmm. the heart of the city. Yeah. Um, so you're one of four prototypes that was chosen, mm -hmm. and there's a partnership with the Cohen design team. Can you tell us a little bit about how that's working with your particular project? It's fascinating because um, similar to during the prototyping festival, when you begin working with people in different fields, different skill sets, the um, project continues to grow and become more than you initially expected, and that's happening now with working with Cohen. They're very talented, um, and they seem like um, they have a very honest interest in um, making whatever project they're working with um, better to whatever ca capacity they can help with. And it's been um, just fantastic back and forth with them, uh, working on the design concept, and um, imagining it now permanently in the city of Rochester. For sure. And what is your sort of long-term vision for what this installation is going to do in the heart of the city? Um, hopefully just continue to uh, connect people in ways, maybe take them out of their um, regular patterns of thought. Um, it'll be, I want it to be non-invasive, so we're not gonna include sound or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So someone can look up and say, oh, nice lights, I don't care. Mm -hmm. Some people can look at it and say, well, my, I just had a relative go through uh, radiation treatment um, and be touched by that and have this new connection to what we typically pass while we walk around Rochester um, with the, all the mirrored over windows and it's the us versus them. Um, feeling or, or everything's underneath this uh, secretive blanket, but these are very real events happening to people. Um, so I want to continue to make those connections if possible and to help people um, 
approach their world differently or show give new ways to approach the world differently to individuals. Great. And you're an artist in your, I guess, everyday life. Mm -hmm. um, how has this kind of taken over your artistic life or mm -hmm. do you feel like you're kind of balancing your arts, arts, artist life and then this prototype mm -hmm. um, design? It's taken over because I now I'm hungry for it. I, I loved it. It was such an incredible experience. I hadn't thought of ever doing it. Yeah. Um, just always putting my head down in my own, driving myself crazy. Yeah. This gave me the opportunity to drive a lot of other people crazy, um, asking for help and then <laughs> pinging them with ridiculous ideas and getting their perspectives. And I want to do it again now. So I think it's um, affected my art life that now I have more concepts brewing um, that I want to kind of test out in the world if possible. Well, that's really exciting. We look forward to seeing this downtown and uh, seeing what you do next. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you, much Eric. for having me. is brought to you in part by the following amazing people and organizations. The new Clements Subaru proudly partners with award-winning KSMQ Public Television. Clements Subaru of Rochester. Clements Clear Value Promise is to make buying a Subaru fast, fair, and simple. The Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. And the members of KSMQ Public Television. Thank you. And kudos certainly to Mr. Anderson, but also our very own Nicole as well. She's a bit modest, so she didn't mention it, but she and her husband are another one of the prototyping designer finalists. And uh, definitely congratulations there. Uh, State Senator Dave Sedgham is here at Grand Rounds Brewing Company at Restaurant. Rochester Republican representing Senate District 25 provides us with a recap of the Minnesota legislative session including the court battle that appears imminent. In our past we march in a giant parade celebrating the Northwest Territory and the Peregrine Falcon population is flying high in downtown Rochester. Up first though we check out one neighborhood celebration that centers on art in this week's Our Culture segment. Hi, I'm Wayne Flock. I'm the board president of Art on the Ave. So Art on the Ave is really a community event uh, put on by the Art on the Ave nonprofit 501c3 independent arts organization. Uh, we're a group that uh, is a group of neighbors that live in this neighborhood, in the Sutterley Park neighborhood, and we put on Art on the Ave every year. Uh, typically it's the third weekend in May is when we shoot for it. It's a host of about 40 to 50 artist vendors, local vendors. Some are coming from the cities, uh, but even locally as well. And the highlight of our event is the installation of a public uh, boulevard sculpture, which is a, a permanent uh, installation. And this is number 13 in series. However, we've been doing this event for about eight years. And as growing each year, I think we're gonna, we're gonna bust our, our, our 3,000 attendance record today, uh, which is pretty exciting. So uh, great food, great beer, uh, great businesses that sponsor us, uh, just a great local community, neighborhood venue and we bring people. The people that are coming to this venue are from all over the city of Rochester, not just our neighborhood. So our target is that we do the uh, third week in May. It's kind of a good time in between. There's a lot of things that happen in Rochester because we try to pack so much in Minnesota into three months of summer. So we, we try to get in the front end of that and really with Thursdays on first uh, happening downtown starting the first Thursday in June we try to get ahead of that. So it's almost like a pre-show for Thursdays on first. In fact, many of the vendors that you'll see here at Art on the Ave also show at Thursdays on First, and they look at Art on the Ave as an actual pre-launch to Thursdays on First, which is a much larger venue. So why Slatterly Park? Slatterly Park is a neighborhood that I live in. Um, I'm a pretty super uh, urban, urbanist in Rochester. I live in our, in our downtown neighborhood, bike to work every day. Uh, I got our neighbors together and we just, we really rallied our neighborhood association and then Art on the Ave grew out of the neighborhood association and then became an independent 501c3 this past year. So really it comes a lot out of me pushing the arts. And also I'm the guy who started Thursdays on First downtown 13 years ago, so I have a little bit of event um, planning background behind me. 
Of course, there's been a lot of people along the way that have helped make that event a further success. And our goal is to make this the artist quarter neighborhood of, of Rochester. It is a lot, but we have a we have a good crew, a awesome crew that we work with. I can't thank enough Art and the Ave board members that help put it on. They're absolutely amazing. And we put a request for proposal out there for a set amount of money, and then the artist follows whatever the theme is. And this year is Spring into New Life, so that was the artist guide. And it's really the artist's interpretation of what that is. And that's what's beautiful, is to celebrate the arts is giving the artists the opportunity to show off their creativity. The future, onward. So we just became a 501c3, so we're looking for a bright future ahead. Um, we have 13 public uh, pieces installed thus far. Our, our goal is to just continue on. And as we as we grow financially, if we have enough, we'll do additional public sculptures, not just this venue. Um, our goal is to also do some arts education. So this year we have a raffle uh, going on at our event booth that's sending a, a child to um, the art camp at the Rochester Art Center this summer. So we want to support other artists organizations as well, because they're here as well today in support of us. Thank you, thank you very much. For more information about this story and other Our Town features, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter at KSMQ hashtag Our Town, or ksmq.org slash Our Town. Summertime brings to mind plenty of outdoor activities and organized sports are plentiful in Rochester. Many of these activities take place at facilities maintained by the Rochester Parks and Recreation Department. A new step recently taken by the Rochester Amateur Sports Commission is the establishment of a 501c3 Sports Commission Foundation to raise private funds to help keep Rochester facilities in good shape, as well as develop new options. To learn more about the sports facility's vision for the city, along with the abundance of sports activities taking place in Rochester this summer, visit rochestersports.org. Laughter is a good medicine. And for devoted fans of Goonies Comedy Club, you will be happy to know that this weekend they are reopening at Crooked Pint Ale House. Goonies owner Mark Clampy and Crooked Pint general manager Nicholas Beck are looking forward to the new partnership. Win-win for everyone, and yeah, lots of laughs. Check out GooniesComedy.com for details. And let me tell you about a pretty peculiar pop-up market. Whew, say that five times fast. Pop-ups are spontaneous little retail opportunities, and this one is offering jewelry, ceramics, textiles, stationery, along with tiny house tours, live music, and according to them, some yummy treats. Proceeds benefit Listos Preschool and Daycare. Check it out on Sunday, June 25th from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And if you're into books, the Friends of the Rochester Public Library are having a book sale Tuesday, June 29th from 9.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. as part of Rochester Fest. This is definitely a good place to stock up for all that reading you'll be doing this summer or next winter. Stay with us as correspondent Danielle Teal gets us up on the roof with Rochester's Peregrine Falcons in this week's Walkabout. This is Danielle Teal with Our Town Walkabout. We're at Mayo Clinic with Tom Behrens. We're excited because we're about to talk about falcons. Yes, and it's an exciting time because it's our 30 year anniversary of this. I came in as a facilities person, so I've been involved with it for 25 years now to help. And uh, so now we're looking at three that we have that are about four weeks old. Yes, they're babies. So they they're kind of. so cute. I know we did a joint venture with EarthCam. So now we have a live feed. You can go out on the Heritage website. And okay, Tom, I want to see them in person. All right. All right, let's do this. Kind of scary situation Come here, on. Tom. <laughs> this is uh, the secret passage up to the roof. This phone's here if we need someone, right? Wow. Top of the sh shaft, we go out that roof hatch. Okay. And that's where the box is at. Oh, wow. <laughs> That was not the class. It wasn't quite as graceful <laughs> as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Can I get a 
they take out a crow? <laughs> I get that ass all the time because somehow I've inherited that too, yeah. so oh, I deal really? with the crows. Good views to well, the plumber building. And all right. You'll be able to see the bottom of the box. Great. So the mom was hovering earlier. She's still up there. Yeah. So Tom, what is so special about the Falcons being here? Well, I think just that how much our patients and, and employees love to watch this whole process and how we've learned to live together. Mm -hmm. I think that's really cool. And, and it's been so successful that they're actually off the endangered species list, so. That's awesome. Well, what do you think? Do you think we ought to get out of this hot weather? Well, for sure, and, it, and the excitement will start in another couple of weeks when they start flying around. Awesome, thank you so much, They'll Tom. They'll be on, you bet. This is Danielle Teal with Our Town Walkabout. Stay with us for more Our Town. Senator Stengem is here to sort out what happened at the conclusion of this year's legislative session. Stick around. Our past, remembering what made us who we are today. Brought to you by the History Center of Olmsted County. In 1787, Congress enacted legislation which created the Northwest Territory, what we know today as the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and parts of eastern Minnesota. 150 years later, President Franklin Roosevelt and the U.S. Congress provided a $100,000 appropriation for the year-long commemoration of the territory's 150th anniversary. Rochester, Minnesota, played host to a symbolic caravan that had crossed the country from Ipswich, Massachusetts. The wagon train traveled the route settlers used 150 years before and arrived in Rochester on August 17, 1938. Rochester Mayor W.A. Moore greeted the caravan members on their arrival. The Northwest Territory had been the first organized territory west of the Appalachian Mountains, so there was much history to portray amongst the more than 500 participants and 30 units comprising floats and marching bands throughout the celebration. that has become common practice to run right up to the end of the legislative session for final deals and negotiations. This year was no exception, plus there was a special session invoked. Here to tell us all about it is Senator Sendra. Welcome, sir. It is good to be here and once it's, again. It's <laughs> over. You were here earlier in the session and now you're here. Uh, we're going to talk about the, sure. that, this lawsuit that's happening and all that mm -hmm. stuff, but first off, uh, how does southeastern Minnesota, Rochester specifically, what did they see in this just past session uh, that will benefit them? Well, I think a lot of things. Uh, we, we put a lot of money in our bonding bill into, into various projects. Uh, one of the things that our engineering folks are going to see right away is a, a lot of what we call road bridge money, uh, local road bridge money with $250 million. That's, that's by far maybe double what we've ever put into that fund before. And that will trickle down to the counties and the cities. They're going to see that. A lot of wastewater infrastructure money. And then maybe more specifically on bonding projects or even transportation projects, the fix up, if you will, of the Rochester Airport is going to be done. Uh, we've got a wastewater treatment study going up at Orinoco, the uh, largest city of Minnesota, out of central septic uh, disposal system. Uh, we've got uh, the Reading Center in Rochester for dyslexic uh, students that, that serves all over Minnesota, but uh, we they get a million and a half and they're going to match that up and put a new center here in Rochester, so that'll be good. Uh, educational village uh, concept down at Winona State University is big, a 20, I think a $20 million, as I recall, uh, in, a, in a lot of teacher training. And they were, we're short on teachers right now and they really want to become a a, a hub, if you will, for teacher training in the state. Just simply as they were almost a century ago. But, uh, so we're reliving that. I think we had a pretty good year in terms of uh, those kind of things. That, and by the way, our bonding bill spread $987 million all over Minnesota. So uh, a lot of good work will be done all over the state. That's great. So for those of us that aren't always at the Capitol, can you talk us a little bit through the process of what the session looked like and this last minute um, special session that was evoked, if you can tell us a little bit more about that. Well, we started on, uh, on January 3rd. Uh, the way the politics fell out, uh, in, at least in the Senate, uh, we were uh, 34 Republicans, 33 Democrats, so very, very tight. Uh, uh, there, no one could be missing, so to speak, if uh, we wanted to get our agenda passed. Uh, the House had much more of a margin on the Republican side. Uh, but we had a, I thought we had a pretty, pretty good year going through the year. We were very, very deliberate. We put the bills together. Everybody said, get your work done early. We did. 
Uh, we wanted the governor to hone in on those. Maybe this is I'm talking about three or four weeks ahead of time. Uh, he said, no, you got to pass the bills first. We, and it, we, we really tried to work with the governor, uh, and it, that part didn't work. So we did ultimately pass the bills, uh, and then we started to work on them with the governor. And, uh, and at that point, we ran out of time. But everything was still, at that point, fairly cordial, I would say. We didn't necessarily uh, have any big fights. There were certainly disagreements. But uh, one of the rules in the Senate, that we, we never took a bill to the floor of the Senate without the governor's concurrence. Not to say that he liked every bill every time, but, uh, but uh, he, he gave a, a wink and a nod, so to speak, let's go ahead and, and go forward with it uh, for every bill that we had. Now, in some cases, we didn't get that discussion over uh, in time, May 22nd, and the governor was cordial enough to, okay, we're, not, we're, we're working towards the goal, we're not there, uh, so immediately after midnight on May 22nd, he called a special session, allowed us to work some more. And so we ultimately did pass all the bills, and then found out he didn't like what he signed. <laughs> and so that's where we are now. And there's a lawsuit because, gee, you know, usually when Republicans get to cut spending and cut programs, they're all for it. But in this case, yeah. the governor cut out funding for the whole legislature. So yeah. there's, a, there's a bone of contention. There's there. a bone of contention there. Uh, there was a, a provision within the state government bill that said basically unless you, unless you uh, if you will, sign the tax bill, put it in the law, which he did, uh, the revenue department is not funded. Well, okay, that, that, that creates clashes, and, and it did. Uh, but nonetheless, he did sign the, uh, sign the tax bill, and so th that is law. But then he goes up in the state, same state government bill, and he crosses out the appropriation for the legislature, both the House and the Senate, Republicans, Democrats, everybody. So at this point, we have, at least we will have, starting July 1st, an unfunded legislature. Uh, so, you know, we've got a little money left over. Staff won't immediately be released, but if this continues, that would, that, that, that would be inevitable in terms and of where his, this goes. His argument is about policy, putting policy in bills. He doesn't like that, he says. Oh, every, I would say to that one, every, I've been there 15 years. There has never been an, what we call an appropriation bill without, a, without policy in it. It, it. It's pretty, it's actually kind of hard to write an appropriation bill without, you know, the policy directs the money. So you have to have policy in an appropriation bill. Just a, a, a pure appropriation bill without policy uh, wouldn't direct the money anywhere. It would just say, here's money to spend. So, uh, so we have to have policy to guide, to guide where the money is spent. And how do you see all this impacting when you go back in for session next session? Uh, going into next year? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it, it's not the most healthy climate right now. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, frankly, that, that good minds can come together that this lawsuit thing, uh, I, I, I frankly think it's, it's almost ridiculous to have one branch of government suing another branch. Uh, we ought to be able to settle these things uh, uh, through you know, mutual work and, and, and good statesmanship and things like that. And, uh, so I'm confident even before July 1st that, that we're gonna get someplace. But, but if we don't, uh, it's, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sad state of affairs when, when, when we're in this kind of a situation. So, well, with uh, the governor's election coming up, does anything get done next? I mean, the kind of a lot of candidates are from within the legislature itself. You know, yeah. does that slow down the process next year? Well, it well it it, it maybe always does. Uh, you know, if uh, for instance, Speaker Dowd is a candidate for for governor, I don't know if that's the case or not. It's kind of rumored. Uh, more than likely, he would like uh, Marty Seifer did a couple years ago. He probably stepped down from the speakership, but he's Peace still, still there. Uh, but uh, and. Uh, Representative Dean, I don't know what he's going to do when it gets right down to it. If he's going to, well, he's going to stay in the legislature. He just doesn't have mm -hmm. a, a, a speakership role, so it's it's a lesser role. So he'd probably stay there. But, but yeah, yeah, I think an election here always puts a different spin on things, especially if you have candidates within the within the framework of the state government that are also running. So, we'll see. There was a big proposal. Uh, talk a little bit about Rochester Community Technical College. They had a large request, and it didn't come through. Yeah, that was uh, what we did in our bonding bill is, is basically kind of picked up the pieces from last year. We had a, we had a bill that, frankly, it, we ran out of time uh, last session uh, due to the, the light, what we call the light rail amendment that, uh, with five minutes to go in the session and just scuttled the whole bill. Uh, but at, at, at that point, uh, what we had done last year, uh, the House has to originate a bonding bill. Uh, they did not have the RCTC proposal in it. We picked up virtually the same bonding bill this year 
and and just since it since it had good support last year, why not run it this year? And that's what we did, and uh, it uh, and it just frankly wasn't in in the uh, in the proposal. So, and uh, and because the house hadn't put it in, basically. So, what we'll do this next year is, uh, you know, I'm I'm chair of the capital investment committee in the Senate. We'll we'll make we'll make sure that that's that's funded. It's certainly time, and I think. You know, everything has a time in, the, in, in this in this process, mm -hmm. and it's it's going to be time for that one. And I'm sure Senator stays busy between sessions. So, what is what's up next for you? Well, uh, what we're doing, uh, I, I've talked about this a little bit. Uh, be be doing a lot of work this summer, uh, gearing up for a big a big year next year in the mental health area. We want to take this one in with with some aggressiveness and, and, and implement good things in Minnesota. Build some facilities, uh, treatment facilities where these, you know, get get professionally, you know, equip these, equip these facilities, the kind of people that need to staff these things. And uh, we've got a great big need there. Uh, more directly, I'm going to Germany tomorrow on an energy trip. So that's going to be interesting. Gee, have fun, <laughs> safe we travels. Will. Safe travel. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us today. And don't forget to connect with us anywhere, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, which is at KSMQ's RT, our town. Send us a picture of your favorite uh, show or of your favorite summertime activity, we might put it on the air. Yeah, that would be great. See you next time on Our Town, the show about Rochester.